And so before I hand it over to Greg, I'd like to first thank our sponsors, uh, the Hegner Family Foundation and North Central Fair. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to bring you these discussions for free. So thank you so much um, to them for their support, and thank you so much for your support in joining us tonight. Um, I'd also like to thank Greg Judy, our speaker tonight, uh, for being with us. I'm really excited about what he's going to be sharing, um, establishing silvopasture and unmanaged forests uh, or forest areas. Um, so I will turn it over to him for, for him to uh, make a better introduction of himself um, and, and to get, get started. Okay, uh, thank you, Christy. I'm Greg Judy. Uh, we live here in central Missouri. Um, we're about 20 miles north of Columbia, Missouri, so we're halfway between St. Louis and Kansas City. Um, Green Pastures Farm is made up of basically uh, 16 farms. Uh, we lease 12 of those farms, and then we own four of them. And so I've been asked to talk a little bit about what we're doing with our civil pasture. And uh, I got kind of introduced to this through the Missouri Agroforestry Group at MU. And uh, so we've been playing around with it, uh, this, I guess going on our fourth year. And um, so I'm going to share with you tonight some of the things that we're doing, some of our goals and aspirations, maybe some of our, so far, successes and some of the failures. Um, but we're really excited, uh, and I think there's some huge advantages. So. With that, uh, I want to get started on our presentation tonight. And, uh, you know, I guess Christy said we hold the questions till the end and, you know, I'll be available to answer some of those if you have any. So, you know, when we're talking about, you know, silvo pasture, this first uh, slide we're showing is basically an area that was unmanaged trees. It was filled full of brush. There wasn't any sunlight getting to the forest floor. And so with selective thinning and leaving the higher quality trees and taking out the unwanted trees, we've actually opened up the canopy and then we brought animals in. Um, it's pretty hard uh, to, control, to control the unwanted vegetation if you don't have some kind of animals following what you're doing. And with our operation, we are a grass-fed beef. Uh, we do grass-fed lamb. Uh, we've got uh, woods pigs uh, and pastured chickens. And we've got into uh, some other enterprises like uh, shiitake uh, mushrooms. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. But so we're taking parts of the farm that has basically been unmanaged timber, and with some selective thinning and then controlled grazing. And I can't overemphasize controlled. Uh, we're not talking about turning animals into woods and just leaving them. So we're going to go over some of that here this evening. Um, you know, what is civil pasture? Well, civil pasture is the deliberate integration of trees and grazing livestock on the same land. Uh, forest products and forage are managed with rotational systems that use short grazing periods to maximize plant growth and harvest. Uh, some of the additional benefits that we have found, uh, first of all, the shaded cool season forages, which most of our forages on our farms are cool season, we ha they have a lower lignin value and versus full sunlight grown forage. So lignin is a compound in forage that animals cannot digest. So the higher, higher the lignin, uh, the, the harder it is for them to, you know, make any use of that as feed. And we're finding out with the, the trees, the forage that grows under the trees, it's just got lower lignin because it doesn't have full sunlight exposure. Um, the next one is a big one, a uh, cooler summer environment for our livestock. You know, in Missouri, uh, you know, you're looking at July and August, it's just miserable. Um, and it can be, now, not every year, but typically you can count on upper 90s, maybe some days over 100 degrees. And folks, what, where livestock get into trouble is the humidity. Uh, we, can, we can reach 90, 95% humidity here. And where animals suffer is when they cannot cool down at night. So let's just say it gets up in 95 and they don't have any shade. Okay, that animal 
it just stays in the high mid to, mid to upper 80s at night, that animal's intestines do not get to cool down. And so they don't get any stress relief at all from the heat. And about a week of that, they're actually losing weight. They may not breed. That They may not even cycle to get bred back for their next calf. So for us, shade's a big issue. Um, you know, we do run red cattle. That helps. Well, we don't run black ones. Black ones are even more prone to heat. Um, so the, the, shade is, the shade aspect is really uh, appealing to us. Um, the, uh, in the wintertime, you know, you've got some trees for wind breaks and things. The animals are a lot more comfortable than in the trees than they are sitting out on top of a ridge somewhere. It gives them some protection from the wind and the elements. Um, item number three, the diversity of income streams spreads risk and increased income opportunities. Folks, it, you know, it's tough on the farm uh, to make a living, a full-time living. And so every income stream or, you know, diversity is, is a great thing, whether it's in the plants on the farm. We love to have diversity in our plants. We like to have diversity in our animals, diversity in wildlife. And at the bottom line, folks, you've got to be profitable. And so if we've got land that we're paying taxes on, we've paid money to buy that land or managing it, and we're not, we're not getting any income from that property. I'm talking about unmanaged timber. Well, let me give you a, a real quick stat. We've got 1,620 acres. 900 of that is timber that's not being managed. So you see why I'm a little bit excited about the opportunities we have. We have a huge potential here to really do some neat things with this unmanaged timber. So uh, we're going to talk more about that. A greater plant nutrient uptake from, you know, from the deep tree roots in symbiosis with the pasture plants the trees, of course, are mining the minerals deep in the soil profile, putting it on the leaves, and then the, the leaves are dropping on the ground or the cattle are eating those leaves, and then the pasture plants have access to that nutrient that they normally wouldn't have had, which is, I think, pretty neat. Uh, there's two methods of creating civil pasture. Uh, you can plant trees into existing pasture. And we're doing some of this as well. On some of the farms, we just don't have anything and we need some shade. We are planting trees. Uh, we've planted over 4,000 trees in the last three years. And we're doing that, you know, in a grazing system, you've got to protect those trees. And so we're putting them next to our fence lines. If we put them out in the pasture, we have to put cages on them until the tree's big enough that it can withstand a cow rubbing on it. Uh, otherwise, we're just going to snap them off. Uh, you know, cows are big, heavy, strong animals. Um, but our biggest possibilities here are, you know, you might say our potential is we're using existing forest and introducing pasture into that. That is our biggest opportunity. And I guess, uh, you know, why I'm so excited about that is when you're done, you have instant shape. I mean, the trees are already there. Um, this is a picture on a lease farm that we just got uh, about a year ago. 120 acres and uh, we, we're using polywire there. You can't see the fence but it's on the back side of the far cows there and it's just a temporary hot farm. Most cows are in their fairly tight stocking density so they're in there but they're only in there for 10 minutes. Okay, We've got another paddock right in front of the direction they're going and it's a small paddock so we'll put cows in an area fairly tight and they'll strip the leaves They'll break down the thatch and they'll defecate in manure and urine and the animal hooves are starting to chiller the leaves on the forest floor. And so we're taking a fungal environment and we're bringing some bacteria in, in the form of the manure from the cows. And I'll show you some other practices that we do to kind of jumpstart this thing. Uh, this is a farm that we got, uh, I guess we've had this in about seven years, and it was solid honey locusts. I mean, there was probably 10,000 honey locust trees out there. And you can see the ones that I left. Um, this is owned by a deer hunter. And um, he came down and saw what I did. I told him I was gonna thin them out. Well, he came down and said, well, you left what? You know, you, you missed some. Look at those out there, you know, you missed some. And I, so I explained to him that honey locust is actually a very good forage uh, tree for deer. 
they, the beans that fall off of those pods, uh, that's a really good food source for deer in late winter. And once I told him that he had a, a deer hotbed down here, he, he backed off and he let me keep these. these. These trees have thorns on them, okay? But I needed some shade out there. I didn't want to cut all those trees. And so I was able to convince him that, you know, I'll keep them under wraps what I left, but we, we're not going to clear that. We're not going to clear that pasture. We need shade out there. And the cattle, you know, when they graze out there, they almost have a smile on their face because there's just shade. It's wonderful. Um, we are planting uh, some chestnut. We have to watch where we plant those in Missouri because we do have heavy clay sod. But down in the loam, the bottom areas, uh, our bottom soil, we, we are planting some of those uh, with moderate success. Um, of course, you know, when you start getting into civil pasture, you're going to have uh, access to firewood and quite a bit of it. And so we're starting, uh, you know, firewood sales. Um, that's another product that you get when you start removing unwanted trees. This is a savannah area. This was all pretty much eastern red cedar. And we took the cedar trees out, opened up the canopy, and then we unrolled hay in there in the wintertime. Look at that. I mean, that's, I think that's pretty impressive. I and mean, that's some pretty grass under the trees. And you see the cows are shaded up. It's a hot day out there. And I just love cows. They can get to the shade. They're just comfortable. The babies are comfortable. You know, everything's, it's a good life. Okay, um, we did invest in uh, our own sawmill because we've got a we've got a lot of trees and a lot of lumber, and so we're working on that. We're developing the market. Uh, we're building some outdoor furniture now. Uh, that particular sawmill there is a, a wood miser. It is portable, so I can take it right to the timber. Uh, I don't have to take the log to the mill. I take the mill to the timber, and that's a big benefit if you're moving a lot of trees. Um, you're not having to transport the logs very far. Um, this is some of the lumber out of, this is some eastern red cedar. And folks, we're getting overrun by eastern red cedar. It's taken over. And um, it's mainly, uh, eastern red cedar grows on land that's been degraded. It's been either farmed or grazed or, or you know, just plowed to death. And so that's the only thing that'll grow on. Um, but it's, it does have a value. I mean, look at the, the heartwood on those, on those boards. I mean, that's, Pretty valuable lumber. Um, we got into making uh, picnic tables. Uh, we are using the live edge. You can see the, the shape of the tree for the seats. Getting into more live edge stuff. And uh, that's a big seller. Um, tongue oil, you know, put tongue oil on them. First, just do a light sanding and it brings out the luster, the luster of the grain. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a really nice product, and it's very attractive. Um, we're doing part, uh, these are just benches. Again, the live, the live edges of the tree, and it's attractive. And, you know, that's what we're in the business of, is you know, selling stuff that looks good. Uh, we're into wildlife, too. You know, we're, we like to have lots of wildlife on our farm, and we're finding out with our managed grazing, we're repulsing the grazing in these timbered areas after removing the unwanted trees, that's where we're starting to see a lot of the deer and turkey. Uh, they like this edge habitat uh, that we've developed along a lot of our fields. And that's, that's pretty important. Uh, how do you graze for better wildlife? Well, idle land, you know, CRP, whatever it is, and maybe an abandoned farm, if it doesn't have animals on it, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's just going to get pretty decadent. Uh, the land needs pulse. It needs ruminant animals trampling on it, trampling that thatch on the ground to get the energy cycle going. It stimulates new plants, and new plants brings what? It brings critters. Um, quality animals require quality forage. So if you're going to grow... I hate to say it, you know, big racks, but, you know, men like to have big racks on their deer. And to be honest with you, four of our farms uh, are basically being managed by their own. They're owned by hunters. And so that's a big deal. You know, we're selling our grazing expertise. Folks, those lease farms that we have for the hunters that are free, we don't pay them anything. 
So we're controlling a three to four hundred thousand dollar piece of property with giving them what they want, big racks. Okay? And we're going to talk about how we do some of that tonight. First of all, you got to heal the soil. Uh, this is a eastern red cedar. It's got we left the deciduous trees, but we took out the eastern red cedar except for that one. We don't take them all out, but we t we we got the the broom sedge. That's a nasty red grass in there, and we bring in fertility. So we bring in purchased hay. We unroll it. And we bring in animals to work that into the ground. Uh, the pigs here, they're actually following the cattle. So the pigs are always down in the rooted draws, and we'll let them have a little bit of the pasture. Not too much, because they got a rooter and they like the root, if you leave them there too long, okay? Um, we're finding out, uh, the couple we've got now managing the pigs, they do a fantastic job of giving them big areas. And by giving them a larger area and moving them faster, those hogs do not root. They just, they don't have time to root and they don't need to root because we're moving them and giving them a large area. If you lock a hog down, you better get ready. It's going to look like a moon, a moonscape because they're going to take everything and just plow it. Uh, this is a, another farm we got uh, three years ago and the cattle have been through there. This is the spring. You can tell it's just getting green. There's no leaves on the trees yet. But look at the grass under the streets. I think that's pretty exciting. I mean, this is an area where we came in and cut out some of the trees. We brought the cattle in there. We have unrolled hay in there for a couple of years now. And there's grass coming in there. I mean, that was basically dry leaves under those trees. So, folks, every day that you can capture a, a grazing day, uh, and what was previously timber, you're trying to get animal days. That's what you get paid for. I mean, you can get an animal day off of a piece of land that wasn't producing anything. That's a plus, okay? And so it starts adding up and you start doing these acres. Uh, this is another one. You can see, look at the locusts in there. The, those are thorny locusts. And people, well, why'd you leave those things for? Um, well, they're a lagoon. Uh, they put down pods, which the cattle like. It produces food. And the leaves that fall off the honey locust, uh, that's solid nitrogen. It's good fertilizer. And the honey locust, you notice the grass? Look at that. It's growing right up to the edge of the trunk. Okay? So that's because you have passing shade. So the, the honey locust lets the sunlight down through there, and you have really good forage under your honey locust. But people get freaked out about these thorns. Oh, your cattle will step on them and they'll all be limping around. Folks, there's been honey locusts on this earth for a long time and cattle are still walking around just fine. So don't get too freaked out about honey locusts. They are, I think they do have a niche in our place. Places, um, you do need to be prepared to control them though. I mean, they, they can get out of hand. You can see what they're kind of been eating on there. Those are oak leaves. It's early spring. They're just starting to get a little green on there. But the sheep uh, winter real well. These are hair sheep, by the way. They're St. Croix uh, sired. There's a little Katahd and some Barbados white belly in some of them. Those darn sheep, they can make a good living on land that cattle will starve to death. I mean, they're just a very low input, a highly profitable animal to run in your, your civil pasture. Uh, they go after the rooty stuff. Uh, the multiple rose bush, they love multiple rose bushes. They love thorn trees, baby sprouts. They love autumn olive. All these things that start coming in and start thinning your timber, these guys here are a work crew. They'll go after that stuff. And they'll get every leaf as high as they can reach. Okay? Uh, this is an area we did some thinning on. You can see some of the trees are still laying on the ground. Um, we do try and pick up the trees, push them in piles. Um, we do have our, we just got our own chipper. And so we're going to be able to chip a lot of these trees now on the ground. I'm excited about putting the carbon right back in the soil. You know, uh, some are landowners that they wanted us to burn the piles. and Gosh, I just hate burning carbon. You know, I'd, I'd rather chip it and either put it in a compost pile, mix, do something with it to build the soil. Don't just throw it back 
into ashes by throwing a match to it. So we're doing some of that. Uh, the pigs, you know, we use two wires to hold them until they get up to about 60 pounds. Those pigs, they're 45 to 50, but pretty soon we can go to one wire. And I'll tell you, when you're running pigs in timber, uh, keep your wire tight and keep it hot. Uh, that wire's got 8,000 volts in it. And what's a pig do? Well, they got that nose. It doesn't have any hair on it. And they'll reach up and they'll touch that hot wire. And they're going to get that. And so a pig's the easiest thing in the world to keep in with hot wire. And I just want to cover one other thing. A, a lot of people say, well, there's been a lot of stuff written about running pigs in woods. And when you take the poly wire down, oh, they won't move. They think it's still there. Trust me, they will move. You've got to spend a little time with your hogs. The R's, you can raise that wire up at a post and stand there and hold it, and they'll walk under it. That's how well trained you can train your hogs. They are very smart individuals. Um, this is unrolling hay in a newly thinned civil pastured area. So the trees would have been thinned in the summer. We brought the carbon in, which is the purchased hay, and we're unrolling that in the snow over those hillsides. And then the cattle are brought in. There's about 300 head of cattle on that area. And I would say there's about uh acre and a half, maybe, uh, of trees that have been removed there. So the cows are eating about 50% of that hay. They're, they're pooping and peeing and stomping the rest of it into the ground. Then they're gone. Folks, they're only on that hay area right there for about eight hours. And then they're gone. They're moved to a new area. Um, if you're going to use animals, make sure that they're fed, okay? Because the last thing you want is your animals to drop weight while you're using them basically as a landscaping service. Uh, this is a newly leased farm we just got. Um, we got this one uh, last fall. It's 120 acres. And the first thing we do is we make it look pretty. And so that's a painted fence post. We built the fence, the landowner paid for the wire, that's high tensile electric wire. And we build the sheep, we build the fence enough that we can run sheep and hogs on that. So those wires are close enough that we can run pigs, sheep, cattle, uh, some goats, some goats that might make a fool of that fence, but um, that'll hold most livestock. And then from that fence in, we went in about 200, now this is about 300 feet deep, and we took out all the junk trees. And when the landowners came out to look at this after we finished it, they just, they were in marvel at it. They said, Greg, our place looks like a park. And they were told that their timber was junk by a forester. He said, your place is just junk. The woods isn't even worth saving. It's just junk because it hasn't been managed. Well, when you do a thinning like this, and you bring the animals in there, then they're gone, and we're unrolling hay in there now. It doesn't look like junk to me. Uh, and we're, we're getting some animal days out of this now, and it's the landowners just tickled, tickled to death of what we've done there. And this is a 10-year release. Uh, I'll back up on that. It's not free. We are giving them their meat. Uh, but still, we're controlling basically uh, almost a $400,000 piece of property here by giving them their meat, which is beef, pork, and lamb for the year. Uh, there's some of our pastured pigs. You can see the grass has grown in the trees. Folks, those pigs have been in there about four days. Now, do you see any bear dirt? I mean, they went through there. They're gleaning. They're gleaning the good stuff out of there. And these pigs are hand-fed once a day. Okay? But when you move them into a fresh paddock, they will not hardly touch their feed for the first 24 hours. They're going after the good stuff. The grubs, they're moving around the dead logs. They're eating some of the forage. Uh, any hickory nut or walnut that escaped through the winter, they're going to get that. Uh, acorns and such. Um, different weeds. They love poison oak. Uh, they'll eat poison oak, and uh, that's kind of nice seeing them take care of some of that stuff. So the hogs are super happy. There's shade in there. There is some sunlight. But, you know, hogs have got to have shade. Um, this is a, a pasture area that uh, is on one of our bigger farms. And uh, <clears throat> it was taken over by uh, bike birds. And so what we did there is we went and we left some of these 
walnuts. See, these are just volunteer walnuts that came up in the blackberries. And we went in and taken out the, the there's some elm, there's some cedar in there. And we've got it opened up enough now that we're starting to get some forages in there. Just with some uh, management. Um, this is where we're using the cows as a bulldozer. Okay. Um, the stock and density, first of all, let me give you the description of stock and density. Stock and density is the number of animals in weight that are on an acre for a given time period. Um, right here, we're stocked at a million pounds per acre. That's a million pounds of beef per acre. Now, they're only on that area for five minutes, okay? You notice in the background, uh, we have got a back fence in there. Those cattle cannot go back to where they were at. They're, they're locked in there, okay? Within five minutes, we move the front fence and they go charging forward. We roll the fence right back up behind them and on the next section. And when those cattle went in there, we're using them to trample the, the multiple rose bushes. They defoliated all the honey locusts, the small ones, and any leaves that were within their reach, they got them. So basically, we used them kind of like a brush hog. But when you looked at the ground after they came out, it looked like you took a floor room and covered that whole area with manure. Just swept it with manure and urine, and it had a real sweet smell to it. It wasn't nasty like a feedlot. It was just a nice, sweet smell. And 60 days later, we came back to that. It's just, oh, it was beautiful. So this is called, in grazing terms, we call this an exclusion zone. You don't have to have hundreds of animals to do this. You can do this with 10 animals or 5 animals. It's all scale relevant. Okay? You can do it with one. Just tie a rope on him and stake him out there and make him trample some of that. Or eat it. Here they are. They're moving down the ridge. You can see where they were at. They really worked that over. Now they're on the next piece and the next piece. And we're just using them as a tool for 5 minute intervals. There's another one that they were on. Uh, here's an eastern red cedar grove. And we, you couldn't even see this pond. It was completely buried in cedar. So we came in and got some sunlight to it, took the cedar off. Those are some of the cedars that we're sawing now. We put some cedars in the pond. We like to put big cedars in there and stake them. And those are fantastic fish covers. Um, you get a lot better fishing if you put some cover in your pond versus a bear pond that doesn't have any cover in it. All right, use a big one because they, you know, they'll last a long time. So what we did, we took the cedar off, we brought in the hay, we unrolled the hay around the stumps, and then we brought the mob in and let them pour. So there it is. There's some fresh hay rolled out, and uh, then the cattle were brought in on top of that. And there they are. And this is, folks, what you're looking at here, this is just solid eastern red cedar. There was no food growing under those trees. Now we were able to leave some uh, white oak, a few black oak, and a few walnut that were growing in the cedar grove, but most of it was just cedar. And this landowner, you know, he wanted he wanted more pasture on his property, so we did that. There's uh, some of the logs that came off of that. Uh, you can see the red centers in them. Uh, those are some pretty good cedars. Some of those were probably 30 feet long. Um, this is before we had the chipper. You know, I, I was talking to Michael Gold. Uh, he's the professor there at Missouri Agroforestry. He's like, Greg, you need to chip that stuff. And so that's, <laughs> we probably, you know, there was a ton of cedar. It would probably take us a year to chip all that. But we're, we're not, we're looking at doing some of that now. There's, I think there's an opportunity. I know there is for chip cedar. Instead of burning it, we can chip it. Um, this is another product. Uh, we're getting into, uh, pretty excited about the shiitake, the shiitake mushrooms. You know, in the winter time around the farm, you're not quite as busy as you are in the summer, and so it's a good uh, practice that we can get into. And uh, on your idle days, you get in the shop there and turn out some shiitake logs. Uh, we can do about 100 a day. Uh, I've got a new gun now, uh, putting in the inoculant and sealing it. I can do a little better than that. But Again, uh, you inoculate that log, and that one log that I used to cut up into firewood, I got we're growing some food on it now. Um, 
we did a thousand, uh, the first, you know, I do everything small scale. There's a, th there's a thousand logs there, okay? Uh, this year we added, uh, last year we added 300, this year we added 400 more, so I think we're up to 1,700 logs. Um, we do them TP style. You've got to put them in the shade. Uh, so we got great big oak trees that got big overhang here. And, you know, we don't do the forest fruiting. I've tried it a little bit, and it does work. You soak the log, and you're guaranteed to have mushrooms in 7 to 10 days. Folks, you can get this many logs. That's a lot more manual labor. So it's whatever you want to do. I mean, if you want to soak them, you go for it. Uh, I will say this. When you soak your logs, a big stock tank is pretty nice. It does shorten the life of your log because you're using up the food in that log a lot faster. Um, we're selling these things now in uh, St. Louis and Columbia. Um, there they are. Uh, that tarp you see there, that's actually a, a, it's a silk screen. It's just a, it's got air that can go through it. But when you first knock, I'm going to go back and get you uh, one more. Um, when you inoculate that, you see that, that netting over there? That netting is over those logs to keep the woodpeckers. You're going to get into this, cover your logs up, and you inoculate them, or your woodpeckers will have a field day. They'll pick out every bit of that spawn, and you'll never get a mushroom. Once the spawn has inoculated the log, the woodpeckers can do whatever they want. They can't kill the log, okay? Um, we're... We're uh, growing about 10 different strands now of shiitakes. And <clears throat> what we're trying to do is have shiitakes all year round. Of course, you won't get them in the winter. But uh, we've got cool season, warm season, wide season. And they're just a wonderful product. And they, they're very tasty, too. Um, that's the night's picking that we picked. There's 180 pounds there of shiitakes at $10 a pound. Um, this is a typical field on an idle farm that we would lease. So that you see the eastern red cedar in there. Folks, that's not very productive. Uh, you can see the brush back there. It's not being managed at all. So those are some of the things that we're looking at. This is a, one of the first tools that we use. This is a little bale and roller that I made. It goes on the back of my ATV. I say little. You can unroll a 1,200-pound net wrap bale with that with the foliar. And the beauty of this is you can run over stumps, um, you know, thorn trees. It doesn't matter. It, you're not going to tear up your truck. And it's a wonderful tool for spreading fertility around your farm, especially in civil pasture areas. So when you roll the fertility, you bring in the animal. There's the manure pad. Now look at that. So I took a, a broom sedge field. I jump started it by bringing the hay in there. The animals consumed that. And this is also what we're seeing in the civil pasture areas. We're getting this. The worms are starting to come into those areas as well. Oh. Um, this is a practice that we've done in the past, and it works really good with the hogs and the cattle. So we did a TSI on this. This is a riparian area, and we took the, uh, all the junk trees out. We left the walnuts and the oaks and some of the hickory, took out the elm, the cedar, uh, some of the other softwoods, and opened up the canopy. And the hogs went through here, and then I came right behind them, and I just basically broadcast with a hand seeder a nine-way cover crop in there. So there's field peas, uh, oh, there's uh, sorghum sedan grass, there's grazing corn, grazing beans, um, radishes, you name it. There's nine different species in there. Okay, uh, this is what we do with the eastern red cedar. Um, we, we drag those things off the field. If you look, see this, this has got grass under it, but there's no, there's no way that that grass is going to survive with that much competition. And so we'll leave the cedar down in the draws for cover, but right on the ridges, we're going we're gonna to remove those. And uh, the neat thing about cedar is you don't have to paint the stump. So when you cut them off, they do not re-sprout. Uh, unlike a lot of your deciduous trees, you've got to do something with the stump or it's going to come back. And maybe you, maybe you want it to come back. I mean, if you're in the goat business and growing, you want to grow a lot of sprouts, you sure don't want to paint the stump. You, you'll get a lot of natural feed from that. Um, this is an area that we hit pretty hard, and uh, this is 100% eastern red cedar. And this is 90 days later, 
uh, the cattle are doing a pretty good job of this. Um, breaking down thatch, we got to get sunlight. Uh, the mob helps bust that thatch down, and organic matter is active, you know, just the active microbes going in the soil. This is one of our deer hunter home farms. It's 40 years idle. There was nothing on that farm for 40 years. We brought the cows in. And, uh, and we're also, the landowner's got quite a bit of timber on here. We're starting to, to build some civil pasture back there. He's liking it. So this is a typical uh, civil pasture area that we've cleared. Uh, this one's about five years old. We left some nice oaks in there. There's some smaller trees. And I, I get that question a lot. You know, by bringing the cattle into the timber, well, well, what about the young trees? You know, aren't they going to kill all of those? Well, you can control that by how long you leave them there. If you wanted some younger trees for a regrowth and for your next, you might say, crop of trees, don't, don't, don't put them in there at 300,000 pounds. You know, maybe leave them in there, uh, you might go 50,000 pounds, okay? And, only, and leave them there, you know, not very long, and they, they, they're not going to tear up those trees. We're getting young, young three generations quite nicely. Again, there's some of the, oh, those things are fat. Um, they're doing pretty happy in there. Uh, there's some, this is the intern that we had. He was moving them out in some of our less accessible areas in the pasture. He worked at it. I mean, he had to carry water to those hogs. There wasn't any piped water on that farm, but, uh, Joe was doing a good job with that. Uh, there's some more of the TSI. Uh, you know, we got the the TSI, the pigs, and then the cows came in behind that. Uh, that's got a cover crop sowed in there. Really high quality forage there. Uh, there's another picture of it. Some more of the cedars. Um, this is a farm we leased. Uh, you know, we left the oak trees out in the field. The rest of that was all eastern red cedar. So that tree now is about twice the size it was when I took that picture about four years ago. Uh, this is a uh, lawn grabber. This is actually on the Judy farm. You can see the shiitake logs that we've cut and piled. Uh, the bigger logs out there, those are some of the saw logs. That is white oak. And uh, then we bring the cattle in there in the winter time. And there's some of the... Uh, on the logs that we cut out of there, uh, we're a little different than a lot of people that do shiitake. I like to cut them four foot. Uh, most people cut them three foot. Uh, a four foot log, of course, you'll get more mushrooms from it. It does take a little bit more spawn, but the you know, spawn's not that expensive. Uh, what I like about the four footers is you get to pick uh, a third of those mushrooms without having to bend over. <laughs> That's a big deal. You know, I'm not 20 years old anymore, so when you got them teepee style and they're taller, you don't get quite as much bending over action to pick your mushrooms. So that's why we pet them four foot. They are a little heavier to handle, but I like them. There we are actually cutting some firewood, there's the lumber, and then there's the pile of logs. So you, you know, we're doing all three at once. Uh, you can't grow shiitakes on dead logs. They've got to be on a live log, and you want to cut them in the fall, when the leaves have already fallen, and you want to cut them before spring erupts. In other words, if you see buds coming up on that tree, you're a little bit late. Uh, you should have cut the tree before that. They just grow, that's when they do the, the best. Uh, there's some of the firewood sales, some more of the mushrooms. Um, so we, we buy the hay. We don't we don't put up any hay on Judy Farms. And there we are in our broom sedge field. And this is actually going down toward the Savannah area. Uh, we're unrolling for fertility. And then uh, we just smother the broom sedge. I love smelling the broom sedge. And then there's your soil life. It just comes, folks. Uh, isn't that a, I mean, those are just beautiful worms. And that broom sedge ridge didn't have any of that in there. But it's just pretty magical. Um, this is an area on a farm that we've had about four years now. It's just a pretty picture. I love the red bud. Um, we've done some thinning down in here, a lot of blackberry. Uh, we opened that up where the cattle can get in there a little better. And now we're starting to grow more forage in there. Another picture. Uh, this is a, an area that we've uh, cleared. Uh, this is probably our oldest savanna. It's around six years of age. We went in and did a, a thinning, and uh, that's what it looked like before. 
we're in this where it looked like after. Now we we trampled <laughs> we trampled a lot of litter there, but we didn't come back, folks. You you can trample some litter on the ground and some grass. It it matters how long it is before you come back. Well, how soon is that? Make sure your plants are fully recovered. And how do you tell that? Well, <clears throat> look at the tips of the plant. If the leaves on the tips of your plants have a sharp point on them, like a pencil point, that plant is fully recovered. You're ready to graze it again. If it's still blunt, like you took a pair of scissors and, and lopped it off, you're coming back too soon. You shouldn't be grazing that. The plants are not ready for animals. Okay. Uh, this is another some of the syllable that we've developed. I mean, it's just beautiful. I just love trees and pasture. I don't like a pasture without this is a little tool, uh, you know, if you don't have a tractor, that log, that's a fresh cut eastern red cedar, it weighs about 800 pounds. It may go more, I mean, it's heavy. You can hardly roll that log over with a, with a, you know, camp. But the way this thing works, it, I'm pulling out the four wheeler. That's probably then a thousand pound log. You put a chain around it, and this roller is down here at the base by your four wheeler. When you take off, that roller goes sliding up that bar and lifts the, that log off the ground. The front of it, the back of it drags. This is a really great tool for small homesteads. You can move that log up to where you're going to saw it or maybe you want to sell it, or whatever you want to do with it. But you can get it out of the timber with your ATV. You don't need a 100 horse tractor to move the log. So it's a great tool. Uh, I'm just going to do a summary real quick. So the diversity of income is, is really important to us. We're trying to make as much income on the farm as we possibly can. And the civil pastures is allowing us to do that. We're getting greater plant nutrient uptake. Uh, our forest areas are getting improved. They look you know, more like a park setting. Um, the mass crops, you know, the trees that we're planting on our farm, we're making sure that they drop some kind of mass, whether it's an acorn, a persimmon, a hickory nut, or whatever, we plant a tree, we want it to feed something. And the improved aesthetics, I mean, we're in the landscaping business, basically, by leasing land. If our farms don't look good, we're probably not going to get a lease. If we get a lease, and we take care of it, and it makes it look like a park, you know, that's part of our secret uh, of keeping happy landlords. Um, and then the livestock, we talked about that, the summer heat protection, that's just huge. Um, I, I can't over decide the importance of that. That's really a good one. And uh, with that, I think I've ended uh, the, the presentation. And I will uh, let uh, Christy come back, and we'll go from here. Great. Thank you so much, Greg. That was that was super informative. I, I certainly learned a lot from this. And I know we already have a couple of questions. Yes, hi. There. Great. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Hedy. I have a question of, he said uh, when uh, he's not running a lot of pigs or the pigs are being rotated really fast. So I would assume he uses a lot less pigs than cows, and I would like to know approximately how many pigs or per cow or how many cows per pig he would recommend to start out with to not have too many pigs who who are causing that. that. Yeah. that that's a great question, Hetty. Um, with our pig management on our farms, we only graze one area of the farm once per year with pigs. So it's got to rest a full year between grazings. And so we're only grazing the pigs in the wooded areas. We don't put them out on top of a pasture. Um, okay. Our pastures are devoted to the cattle, okay? But the mm -hmm. pigs, if you, to give you an example, um, right now we're getting ready to do our a summer bunch. Our, our winter bunch was actually hauled to the processor yesterday. And uh, they finished at about 330 pounds. And we run the uh, Berkshire and sometimes a Berkshire Red Wattle Cross. But on, say, 25 pigs, we'd give those pigs, now we're talking about big pigs, 300-pounders. Uh, mm -hmm. They would get about five acres. When they're little guys, uh, you know, 20, 30-pound feeder pigs, 
and you got, let's say, 25 of them, you could probably get by on a quarter of an acre. You watch the ground. When they, if you start mm-hmm. seeing more more uh, rooting than you like, move them. Get them going. Yeah. And they will not root if you move them. If you leave them in one area, they're going to tear it up. Okay. So start really slow. So if I want to use as much as of the forested area with the pigs. Thank you so yeah. much for your great presentation. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for checking in. Um, I've got a question here from Paul. Um, he asks, "How might we protect and continue to grow culturally significant plants that grow in forest understories, so that forest plant diversity isn't wiped out and replaced with pasture?" Well, first of all, we're all about diversity. I, you know, I love wildlife. I, I like going into timber. I don't want to see a solid stand of anything. Um, so, you know, it, uh, it's all it's all driven by your management. Um, if you want diversity, you can't just leave animals in an area. It will get too bacterial. In fact, you know, in other words, you're going to get too much bacteria in there and not any fungi. Well, then it's going to be uh, bacteria dominated, and you turned it into grassland. So you got to have some of the fungi in there. And I've been on areas of our farm. You know, um, we go into some pretty rough areas. And I'll tell you this: the, the steeper the terrain, you've got to be really careful, especially with cattle. Um, but it's it's all driven by your management, you know. And it's 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 a skill. It's a skill you got to learn, and you know you got to start. And that's most people are afraid to start and you're going to make some mistakes but you know develop your your skills as you go and i think you can you can have the best of both worlds susan in the chat that asked is there a good way to get rid of broom grass bring in roll hay and put cattle then pigs i think you might have covered this a little bit yeah uh any t- anytime you have a monoculture um stock and density can can really uh, change the uh, the structure of that. To give you an example, like you know, fescue. Fescue can be a really nasty one too. If it's just if you're trying to graze a hundred percent stand of Kentucky 31 infected fescue, you're going to have troubles. But with stock and density, where you where you start getting the animals in there tighter for short periods and let their hooves uh, impact the ground, I call it bruising the soil for a short period of time, you will start to see some diversity come into those areas. You won't have a 100% stand of anything. And so, you know, some people get freaked out when they say, oh, there's a weed out there. Well, is it a weed? Maybe not. You know, if a cow eats it, or a sheep, or a goat, I call that a forb. You know, that, that's food. So, we like we like to see diversity in our pastures. And, you know, anytime you see a solid stand of anything, that's telling me that you got very low stock and density. You need to, you need to hit, impact that area. Oh, and one way, one way of doing that is that exclusion zone that you saw, that picture. Just take some polywire and, and do a trial. Go out there and, and fence off a quarter acre, and put your, you know, uh, on a quarter acre, uh, maybe 25, 30 cows. If you don't have that many, uh, maybe do a, a you know, a, a 40 foot by 40 foot area and put five cows in there, walk them around in there, put a bale on there, a bale of hay to, to get some excitement or maybe a mineral block or something and, and let them stir the ground with their feet and then mark that area and come back and look at it 60 days and see if you have a solid standard broom anymore. Great, thank you. Um, Mark has a question and I'm going to unmute you right now, Mark. Um, I'm wondering what kind of hay you're using to unroll after you've cleared the forest. Are you using grass hay and alfalfa hay, or what What are you using? Yeah, uh, mo- most of our hay is uh, orchard grass uh, mixed with red clover. Um, it's pretty high quality hay. Uh, it's, it has been net wrapped, and uh, you know, when you unroll it, the cows go after it pretty judiciously. So. Because it is pretty high quality hay, one thing you got to remember is when you're unrolling hay to feed the soil, the return that you get on that unrolled hay is directly re- in proportion with how high a quality the hay is. So let's just say you went out and bought some broom sedge hay. 
somebody that rolled up some brooms says you made hay out of it. When you unroll that on land, you're not helping it a whole lot. It is a carbon, and yeah, it will break down, but well, there's very little fertility in, in brood seeds. So I would rather unroll fairly high-quality high hay if I can get my hands on it. First of all, your animals are going to do better, and the hay that they waste, you're going to get a bigger bang for your buck on your fertilizer from that hay. Okay? That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. We've got another question in the chat. Uh, Wendy's asking, for new planting in a treeless pasture, what do you recommend for fencing in cages to protect your trees from sheep and cattle? Tree shelters, um, how do you pin the cages down so that they're firm? Well, s some of the things that we've been doing is, is kind of unorthodox, but um, we're actually using some of the trees that nature puts out there. So if I see a sprout, let's say a, a, a walnut sprout or an oak sprout, it's, let's say a foot tall, the cattle haven't bothered it. I'll use uh, cattle panels. Uh, you can get cattle panels and take bolt cutters and cut them up and put three steel posts, put a cattle panel around it, and boy, that is a very effective livestock deterrent. Um, you know, sheep can't get through that. I guess a goat might climb up on it. And, you know, goats are pretty, pretty wiry. They can do about anything, but it's definitely a, a good fence against cattle. Um, but our main, our main protectant is electric fence um, because we have electric on all of our farms. Uh, you know, when the cattle come into those areas, we run poly wire around the trees. Okay. It's got a hot wire on one side, and then we put poly wire in front of it. And we'll keep that wire about a foot and a half away from the trees. So the cattle cannot reach over there and rip the leaves and the branches off the trees. Uh, that's been working pretty successful. For sheep, uh, you've got to use something. Uh, uh, you're going to need more than one poly. You're going to need several wires because sheep are smaller. They can duck underneath, you know a cattle fence and they'll still get in there and possibly do some damage to your trees. And with the poly wire, do you have any problems with uh, competition um, for the trees uh, if, the, if the cattle or, or sheep can't access right near the tree um, and the trees are very small? Is there any? Yes, uh, that, that, that can be an issue, especially with sod. You know, uh, fescue sod is really can take a lot of moisture away from the young trees. And one of the things we have started doing is putting down mulch. Uh, you know, and a lot of people, it depends on your beliefs. Uh, it's against my belief. I'm not going to do it. But a lot of people round up it. You know, they spray round up around the trunk and kill the sod. I'm not going to spray that on my farms. But uh, we are using a thick layer of hay or, you know, wood chips, uh, wood chips that have been... Uh, uh, composted for a while where they lost a lot of the acidity and uh, a big thick layer of that around the, the trunks of the trees. That'll keep the sod back and give the tree a pretty good jump start. If you don't control the sod, uh, those young trees, it's a pretty rough life for them. Cause, you know, they're, they're competing against moisture with that sod that's established. And right. the, the sod always, yeah, you know, the sod will always win and the tree loses. Um. Paul's got a question here. Uh, so he's, he's working on this question. Um, and so he's curious, how do you include indigenous communities working on sovereignty in regards to land, plant, foods, uh, food systems? Um, you may not be doing this yet, but if you are, he'd really appreciate hearing. Yeah, I don't, I'm not working on that at the moment. So I really can't, I don't have too much to say on that one. And uh, so I had a, I had a question um, about the shiitakes. Um, are you selling them at farmers markets? Or are you how are you, how are you marketing those shiitakes? Yeah, they're they're mainly being sold at uh, restaurants and health food stores. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, and re the restaurants are pretty good. Um, you know. Uh, because we don't do force fruiting, force fruiting means that we're soaking them. When you do soak a mushroom log, you are guaranteed to have mushrooms at a certain time. And you can, 
let's just say you you got a, an account with a restaurant, and they say, well, Greg, we need 10 pounds every Monday. Okay. Well, if you're going to do that, you need to count back seven to 10 days, and you need to soak. Well, for 20 or 10 pounds, you need to soak 20 logs. And each log gives you about a half a pound of mushrooms per flush. Now you can get that flush every eight weeks, all through the growing season. Okay. So you can do that. Uh, I don't have the desire to handle that many logs. So what we do is when it rains, you know, in our restaurants, they know that. They're going to get a call from us, and we're going to be unloading some mushrooms. Um, so that, that's kind of how it works. I have watered them out of our lake, and it, it gets to be work. You know, we start sprinkling a 1,000 logs. That's moving a right. lot of sprinklers around. Yeah, that is. Right. Um, Gary has another question. Um, Greg, are you spraying any compost tea to jumpstart the bacteria type environment? Do you ever use compost um, tea with raw milk spray? Yeah, I've done a little bit of all that. I've actually got a brewer. Uh, I've got a field sprayer that I pull. It's a 160 gallon compost tea sprayer that goes behind my full wheeler. And I've done the raw milk. Um, I have not seen a lot of conclusive evidence yet uh, of benefits from that. I can tell you I spent a lot of time with it. Um, one of the one of the issues, we've even got our own microscope. We've taken probably 500 soil samples. And we, you know, I've taken the Elaine Ingham course. And as a matter of fact, we had Elaine here for a, a conference. And uh, one of the things that's lacking in our soils, folks, is the is the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And to get really good uh, grasses grown, you got you need to have about 50% bacteria, 50% fungi. And uh, because of the history of a lot of this land that's been worked, uh, it's killed a lot of the fungi. And so how do we get that back? Um, you know, that's, that's, that's a $50,000 question. And... Um, Anyway, I, I've talked to some people. One of them is uh, Dr. Uh, Wendy Tahira. Uh, if you've never seen her talk, you ought to go on the internet and look it up. I, I'm not going to spell her name exactly right, but it'll get you close. It's T E H E R I, Dr. Wendy Tahira. And she has a great 30 minute talk on our muscular microalgae fungi, what it is, why we need it. And she's identified the spores. The actual fungi spores that we need out in our, in our rain, you know, in the, in the grasslands. And so I'm excited about some of her research. And if we can get some of that, uh, we might still play around with some of the, the teas and things. But it's not as easy as what it sounds. You just can't put <laughs> compost in a sprayer and mix it up and spray it, okay? It, it, there's a little bit more to us than that. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Paul asks, how do you transport livestock to abattoirs? Um, how is the local abattoir situation doing? Uh, the ones in Ontario, Canada are closing down due to large scale pressure. Yeah, that, that's probably one of the, the weakest links in the small farmer, uh, you know, bringing meat to customers is, you know, the USDA, they want to they want to be able to put an inspector in a plant that's doing you know twenty thousand bees a day. They don't want somebody to do five. Uh, and so what we're working with is just a, a state inspected plant. We don't do USDA, and our plant is five miles from our house. And so when I haul an animal to the arbiter, which we just did last week, I always bring a friend with me, and the friend gets to come back. Okay, don't ever haul an animal to the abattoir by itself. You just put a lot of stress on them. And so you can ruin an animal in the last 30 minutes of his life by putting unneeded stress. Um, so yeah, our animals get a, a, a companion brought with them. That, I think that helps. Um, we, we do taste test all of our animals. The ones that we let them hang for 10 days, I'm talking about beef. Um, the lamb and the, and the pigs, you don't. There's no problem. They're, they're always tender, tasty. But some of the bees, and when you're doing grass finish, you know, some, for whatever reason, some of them you need to, you know, you might have a, uh, some connective tissue in there. You need to sort those out. 
But the arbiters are a very weak link, and I think it is an issue. I don't know. I don't know the real answer to it. I, um, you know, just like like the gentleman said, they are shutting down a lot of those plants, and it's tough because our our guy that we use, he's it's a family operated unit, and for him to go USDA, just the lagoon to build for that plant was going to be about three hundred thousand dollars. Well, how many small operators can afford three hundred thousand dollars a year? That's not counting the the building, just the darn lagoon. So there's a lot of a lot of regulations that are just making it pretty tough on you know small small arbitrage to stay in business. Paul wants you to talk a little bit about uh, the biggest challenge with leasing versus owning land. The biggest challenge is getting that first lease. Um, you know, if you don't have any land set up under your management, so you don't have anything to show a prospective landowner what you can do with their farm if you get a chance to lease it, that makes it a little tougher. Um, we had a farm, and, and I had it set up into, at that time, just management and some grazing. And uh, so I had a farm to go, my first landowner, I actually went out, I tell you, I just took a video of it. I went out and moved the cows that night and showed them how I was giving it rest period, what the pasture looked like, what the steers looked like. I was building soil. I wasn't mining the soil like a lot of people do uh, by taking the hay off your land. And uh, I explored the wildlife, as the wildlife aspect of it. And I sent him that video. And it was on an old 8-track video record. The darn thing weighed 20 pounds. I packed around on my shoulder. You know what? He he watched that, him and his family. And I got a phone call, like, that night after they watched it. And, um, yeah, I got the lease, 160 acres. So that was my first start. Well, when you get a piece of land, if you're fortunate enough to lease a piece, treat it like you own it. I mean, really do everything you can to make that thing look sharp. People want their farms to look nice. And, you know, that's what we work on. We're working on that today on a farm, uh, there's some metal left that these people left. It's laying out, looks bad. You know, we're cleaning that metal up. Um, if you build a fence, don't do it halfway. Build a nice fence where it looks attractive. Um, you know, you are in the landscaping business when you're leasing land versus owning land. Now, I'm not against land ownership. I am not because we, we now own four farms, but we paid cash for those farms because we can do that now. But starting out, I think it's a real hamstring on a young grazer to expect him to go out here buy. Well, first of all, if you're going to try and make a living on land, you've got to be able to run some animals on there. I'm talking about some numbers. And, you know, in the beef cattle business, you're talking minimum probably 40 to 50 head. So that's going to take you 100, 150 acres maybe. Maybe more, depending on the land. But So now you've tied yourself up with three to $400,000 debt. That's what it would cost around here to buy that kind of land. And you don't have any money left to manage the farm. Or you can't buy any animals. Uh, you don't have any money. Uh, you can't build any fence. You can't establish the water. So owning comes in nice later on. And there's nothing wrong with owning what I call a, a home place. In other words, where, you, where your homestead is. Your house and the space 10 acres or 20, whatever. That's fine. But don't hamstring yourself by getting four or five hundred thousand four or five hundred thousand dollars worth of land and being, you know, basically a servitude or service servant to the bank the rest of your life. You don't want to do that. Yeah, that's a great perspective. Thank you. Um Wendy asks, what do you do for shade in areas with small growing trees? We always uh, well, first of all, on our farms, we're in the rolling hills out here. Uh, actually, we're right at the start of the Missouri Ozarks, they say. I mean, if you go five miles uh, east of us, we're in the prairie, okay? But we're in the rolling hills and there's trees. So most of our paddocks that we've got set up, uh, we have some tree exposure. And so we will build a lane to let the cattle on a really hot day. When I'm talking about, let's say, 90 to 95 degrees. Folks, those animals need a tree. If they don't, 
you need to build some kind of temporary shelter that you can move around, kind of like the shade mobile that you're, I'm sure you've seen Joel Salatin use. Uh, the other thing that'll help you is if you're in the beef cattle business, make sure you don't have black cattle. Either get red ones or white ones. Um, they don't heat up. They don't heat up like the black ones do. So that's something you can do right off the bat. Um, but if you just got a farm and all there is out there is small trees, you don't have any shade, well then you're kind of stuck. You're going to have to do some kind of shade mobile that's on runners. Maybe you can hook that on your four wheeler or whatever, or your pickup truck, and you can drag that thing around your pastures. And all it would need to be would be a steel frame with shade cloth on it. That's it. You don't need metal. Just put a shade cloth on it and use on these greenhouses. That would be fairly light. You can drag that thing around. And the beauty of that is you're concentrating your fertility right under that shade structure. So if you had a really poor spot of your farm that needed some manure, park it out there, and that's where you're going to get your manure and urine at. Is right underneath that shade. Great. Um, Wendy also asks, with your rotation, have you had to deworm? No, we we haven't wormed an animal in uh, let's see, 17 years. We don't worm the calves, we don't worm the pigs, we don't worm the sheep. Of course, the sheep are parasite resistant. We we only keep sheep that can make it without being wormed. The cattle, uh, you know. Here's the deal on cattle. First of all, we move our cows twice a day, morning and night. Uh, in the green season, when it's growing really quickly, we may move them three to four times a day. The parasites live in the bottom canopy of the grass, away from the sunlight. So if you're focusing your, your animals on eating just the top portion of the plant, first of all, they're not ingesting a lot of parasites. Let your animals build up a resistance. Okay, if you constantly are worming your animal, you're not allowing them to build up any resistance to parasites, and you put a crutch under that animal, you've really done a disservice to her or it. Um, pull the wormer, the ones that don't do well and stay skinny and have dirty manure tails, sell them, get rid of them, uh, never name an animal on your farm. <laughs> It makes it harder to call them, you know. Um, so animals that don't perform without worming, just get rid of them. Because all they're going to do is propagate more of the same. Uh, my question is, who wormed the animals for thousands of years before a white man arrived with a firearm? Nobody. And they still survived. They did quite nice. That's because they were moving. When you make animals stay in their feces, and they're exposed to their feces, you're going to get parasites. Um, and when you also ask, how do you water your life? Um, how do you water your livestock in your rotation? We have several different systems. Uh, my favorite uh, is ponds. Uh, we build because we are on a heavy clay, yellow bait, it's yellow clay. Uh, we can build ponds out here anywhere we have a slight draw. It's unbelievable uh, where we can build ponds. Um, to give you an example, last year we had a really dry summer and that was good pond building with us. So I brought a dozer in. I had I don't get I don't I do not run the dozer. Okay. I have a guy that's good at it. And uh, we built a series of ponds where we needed them and so I always put a pipe in the bottom of it. A two inch P V C pipe. And it goes out into the new pond, it's in the bottom of the dam. And he builds a dam over the pipe. Well, then I put a standoff on the inside of the pond with a cap on it, drill holes in it, so the water comes through that pipe and it goes out the back of the pond where there's a shot off, and that's hooked to a tire tank. I love tire tanks because they're, they're rust proof, they're rot proof, they're bullet proof, basically. I mean, you can shoot one, but it's not going to destroy it like it will a, a metal tank or a plastic tank. And you can get them for ten, you know, ten, fifteen dollars, what they call loading fee at these recycling centers. And a lot of people get all freaked out. Oh, it's rubber, it's rubber this, and it's rubber that. Folks, that's vulcanized rubber, extreme heat. I've taken tests of the water in a tire tank. There is no nitrates. There is no chemical residue in that water. It's clean. Okay. Um, then we pour sacrete in the bottom of the tire. The sac creek is concrete, that's our bottom. 
and that works good. We do have some pressurized water. Uh, on some of the farms, we're on the water line, same water that people drink in their houses. I don't want to depend on water lines, and that's because in the future, it may become, water may become so scarce that livestock are not allowed to drink human water. I've already seen it happen in Kentucky. Uh, they got the severe drought, uh, the water company came in and actually yanked the meters off the cattle ranches because the cattlemen continued to water the livestock. So be careful. Try and be water independent. But what I mean is capture the water on your farm. Build an impoundment. Once you capture that water on your farm, it's yours. Okay, and it came out of the sky. Um, so yeah, ponds are my favorite. So if there's, if there's no other questions, um, I'd like to thank you again, Greg, for sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you so much for joining us, and I hope everybody has a great night tonight. Thank you so much.